Cool. So, um, Ani Bojo Tanchakiwa, Mishan Dengue, and Quat Quain Dishnakas, Pakjahan Sain Donjaba, Umamue Nene, Nishnabe King and Donji, Makwando Dam, um, Nisamedana Ashenish, Nadiso Bonwe, um, yeah, Machifan uh, Dow, um, that's a little bit about me. So hi everyone, my name is Gabrielle Fayant. I'm originally from Alberta. My family comes from Fishing Lake Métis Settlement, also known as Puck Jahanse or Sputnow. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be your host for this webinar um, that's about women and femmes on the front lines. Um, so we have some really awesome guests with us today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what um, you all have to say and how your experiences have been. Um, so the intentions of the webinar are just that, to, to listen to some of the struggles, some of the challenges, as well as some of the best practices um, that, that women and femme identifying folks have had um, as land defenders or water protectors, um, just on the front lines and grassroots movements. Um, and so this webinar is hosted by the Assembly of Seven Generations or A7G um, with funding from Taking It Global. Um, and it's a series we've been doing uh, since the beginning of the pandemic called Web called wellness webinars. Um, and so it's just a it's just like a feel good kind of webinar to bring people a little bit more connected, even though we're in virtual spaces. Um, so those are some of the intentions as well. Um, I was having a conversation with a few a few folks on the panel um, in last summer, and we we're talking about you know some of the uh, some of the violence that happens um, in frontline movements um, and in grassroots communities, and um, it was uh, something that I really wanted to do is to showcase you know the best practices and kind of show that truth that kind of un those untold truths that we don't really get enough space to talk about. Um, and I just wanted to like create a platform and amplify uh, some really awesome folks that are doing really hard work, um, but uh, really in really beautiful ways. And so um, those are some of my guests that I have. Um, so we have Christy Belcourt, Sophia Sedarius, Kanahas Manuel and V Guzman. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pass it over to you all to introduce yourself. So maybe we'll start off with uh, Christy. So you could just introduce yourself, your pronouns, as well as just how you're doing. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christy Belcourt and uh, I am the chef. My ancestry is from Lac Saint Anne in Alberta. Uh, I never lived there but uh, that's where my grandparents are from. I come from Cree speaking people and I don't speak the language, but I'm an avid uh, language learner. <laughs> so I'm really trying hard to, to get back the language. Uh, and uh, I refer to myself as she or Isqueo or Que. Um, so that's my pronouns. And um, I'm, doing, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm anxious to hear what how everybody else is doing, and thank you, Gabby and Josh, and everybody at A7G for uh, hosting this because this is a really important conversation. And I like the way that we're doing this because it's empowering to hear from each other about um, the things that you that you outlined at the start. So I'll just end it there. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so I'll pass it over to you, Sophia. Hey, Ninda Luisi Sofia Ahnin again, Bogwe, Rohatnog, Madapanagia, Glewe. My name is Sofia. I come from Madapanagia First Nation, um, out in Mi'kma'ki. And um, and yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. <laughs> I think everyone's kind of tired of the Zoom calls, but you know, that's life. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say. Well, adio. 
Cool. I'll pass it over to you, Kenahas. Wait, kahoy, tip. Um, this is Kanahus Manuel here. Could you hear me? Um, I have. Um, I'm here calling in from Sequatmuk Territory, unceded, unsurrendered Sequatmuk Territory and so-called BC Canada from the pipelines fighting the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I'm here um, calling from Tiny House Warriors. I'm a mother of four and refer to myself as a warrior, um, pronouns she and her, thanks. Thanks, um, and I'll pass it over to you, V. Yektayuya, hi, uh, my name is uh, Victoria Guzman, although people just call me V. Um, uh, I'm uh, of the Nawa people. My family came to Canada in the 80s, uh, escaping war. So I am uh, a guest on these territories here in Amiskwichi, Wiskaigan, Treaty 6 territory. I work in solidarity and quite closely with inner city communities, uh, indigenous, black, racialized communities living in the hood here. Uh, we do a lot of well, working in solidarity with like communities who have been like directly impacted by all the things, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. There's like a lot that I don't even know how to. Yeah, so that's kind of what I do out here. Oh, and my pronouns are they, them. Yeah. So I wasn't exactly sure like how I wanted to line up the questions. I wanted to kind of play it by ear and see how the conversation goes. Um, but I'm thinking this might be a really good question to start off the webinar. Um, and so the question is, how did you know that this work was your calling or your purpose? Um, so I'll pass it over to Sophia first. So my first question is, do you want the short version or the long version? Because the long version could take several hours. Um, <laughs> but the short version, I guess, uh, would be that um, I started when I was kind of younger. Um, I wasn't necessarily on the front lines, but I was more um, just listening to my parents and um, the people around me talk about their work and um, their their struggles just as people you know not necessarily on the front lines but just being indigenous or um, having connections to indigenous communities that are really struggling you know going through poverty uh, systemic racism violence lateral violence um, and things like that and experiencing that myself um, in my community firsthand and um, and you know it really shapes I guess your perspective on on Canada as a whole and Canadians when um, you see kind of the interactions you have uh, with Canadians that either A, don't know that you guys exist or B, have no idea what your realities are in your community. Um, so that, that really impacted me to educate and to learn myself. Um, more about the struggles that we face as Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island and um, and yeah like I don't know it just kind of happened like I was talking and and connecting with people and then all of a sudden I ended up on the front lines uh, just because of who I was with and and where my heart was and my heart led to the front lines where the struggles really um, are there firsthand and um, where my people needed me at the time. So um, that kind of took a life of its own, I guess. And, and then of course, um, what wouldn't happened and, you know, Gabby, you know this, and I'm sure other people here have, uh, have uh, mobilized for that when, when we were at our highest point, but um, uh, we mobilized everywhere. And that was really, you know, like a learning opportunity for me too, to uh, know how to mobilize in cities where I'm not necessarily on the front lines, but to bring the front line struggle to um, to cities and to uh, major metropolitan areas um, where they need to be uh, brought forth. Where you know, especially in the nation's capital, um, 
we have a specific uh, audience and I felt like we really needed to um, bring that forward and for people to know that the struggle doesn't just impact wherever the front line is, that the front line can be brought wherever front liners are. Um, so that was a really unique experience and I'm really glad that um, that happened. Um, and I'm sure like we'll get into it later, but of course there were, you know, intergroup problems and, and problems within organizing, um, which, which happens, you know, it's, it's inevitable, but um, keeping like a strong face and making sure that that doesn't impact the movement is really important to me. So um, I think that we'll, we'll probably dive into that further, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, I'll pass it over to you, V. Um, so how did you know that this work was your calling or your purpose? Okay. It's like, is it okay if I like talk like for a bit? <laughs> yeah, because that's like, huh, I feel, I, I, I think since I was like a little kid because of what my family went through with war so i was like, like radicalized since like infancy because of the injustices that my own people experienced like being forced from our lands and being forced to come to you know this land that was also sto like stolen as well and yeah and it's just and I, yeah, I don't even know how to like form that into words because it's that's like also like a, a bag of the, like of a lot of trauma, <laughs> right? But um, you know, and growing growing up too, like in my community, I grew up you know um, south of Edmonton. I also spent a lot of time in the inner city and in, like low income community, mostly like. Uh, Central American, immigrant, African, Black, Métis, a lot of urban Indigenous folks I grew up with. And, you know, we all had like a lot of shared family like trauma, whether it was like with war or residential school or just like, you know, just colonialism in general and the ways that that shaped our upbringings. And I started asking questions at a really young age, like, why are we like, why are all my friends and I like getting caught up in like, addictions and you know uh, homelessness and also I I think what really like hit it for me was um, like the the health issues that I developed at a really young age I had like corrective spinal surgery at a really young age uh, most of my family members developed scoliosis after they left the war and a lot of that was because of like land and body trauma that occurred. And a lot of my friends growing up developed like early onsets of diabetes and all these health issues that were like affecting our, like just living a normal life. And I, and I started making these connections of, oh, this all goes back to, you know, land trauma. And even here in Edmonton, like with the refineries that are literally just minutes outside of you know, uh, just of east of Edmonton, like the pollution here and like how that's like, how that's also super normalized and that just, that affects everybody, you know, especially like communities that, like up the river that have to drink the water that comes through the city and goes up there, right? And a lot of the air pollution that gets pushed over to like these low-income neighborhoods like in Northern Edmonton. So I, it was like a lot of like experiencing these like intersecting things that were being impacted by like the land pollution here and my own experience my own lived experiences as well and like a lot of learning too and like through relationships with like my own community members here as well that I grew up around so yeah I guess like to put it in like short form I guess it was like a lot a lot of that but I think you know, out, out, outside of like a lot of the pain that I experienced that radicalized me. It was a lot of the hard learning I went through when I was younger. Um, I 
first got involved in a lot of this work, maybe back in like 2013. Uh, I think it started at the, the last healing walk in Northern Alberta. It was like 2014 or something. And there wasn't a lot of young people that were up there. And I was like of part of like a small group of youth that came from Edmonton. I didn't know anyone and just walking, like spending like eight hours walking around these tailing ponds, you know, I was just like, this is like, I got to do something about this and feeling incredibly alone in that as well, because a lot of the people that I looked up to were either like moving away or just like dealing with a lot of their own business too, with wh whether it was family or, you know, they were working in their own communities, like, so there wasn't a lot of like work being done like in the inner city around like, you know, tar sands and pipelines and environmental justice. So I, I really kind of like went head first into it, not knowing what I was doing. So I guess like where I'm at now, it's been a lot of, I've had making a lot of mistakes and figuring out who I am in relation to like being on this territory and, you know, being called in by like, mentors and people I'm really proud to like call my sisters as well and spending years like building relationships and having conversations and just like doing the work and making mistakes and just keep just going yeah and like I guess I feel like I've missed a lot but that's yeah that's kind of like where I'm at right now I think <laughs> with that yeah nice um I can uh I can relate in some ways, like, cause I, I was raised in Edmonton pretty much. And yeah, it's, it's rough in Edmonton, you know, like the racism is, is really heavy over there. So, you know, yeah, like, I just like a lot of kudos to you for organizing in, in that type of situation. And yeah, I'm hearing from the both of you, like, like a, an underlying reason you do it is because it's like selflessness you want to see better for your peers and your families and your communities and that's really awesome um so i'll pass it over to you christy um so the question is how did you know that the work that this work was your calling or your purpose well i just want to thank v and sophie for their what they said like it was uh, really nice to hear and learn about you and what you're doing and what your thoughts are um so i was born in 1966 and that makes me 54 years old now so i've been around uh the sun and the moon a couple times <laughs> this is this is uh so i've had quite a few winters i guess and so what happens is, um, you know, when I was growing up, it was in the height of Métis and non-status Indian politics, I guess. And uh, those leaders at the time, including uh, Kanahos' uh, grandpa, you know, and my dad and, and, and all sorts of people, although they may have differed um, on, on certain things politically, the one thing that everybody that you always heard everybody talk about was our land was stolen. Like that was something that was just a, a given, you know, you heard that from old people all the time and older people all the time that was just understood. And so that you grow up with that understanding, you know, that it's in you that there's been an injustice and that there's stories about it, about how your lands became stolen. There's stories that you overheard, even as a kid, if you weren't interested, you still overheard these things and it becomes part of you. And then as I um, began to, to, when I moved out of the city and began to spend time on the land, um, it was the animals and the insects and the plants particularly that began to teach me and make me really appreciate them in a profound and deep spiritual way that I understood more of a global understanding of how important um, the land is to be able to keep in a healthy way for the sustaining of all life on the planet and in the waters, but also how Indigenous people are important and integral to that. And 
So seeing that our lands were stolen and seeing how having that connection to the lands and to the waters in, in, and also attending many ceremonies and being part of that and fasting and doing all those things made me understand in a really deep sense of who I am that it's that I need to step up and I need to do what I can. And that said, uh, for some of you that, that maybe don't know, um, me and, and some others, uh, quite a few other people, started uh, a camp called Nimki Ajbikong. And it's, it's located in Nishnabek territory. I'm not Nishnabe, but I'm, I'm helping, I guess. And we don't have, uh, uh, although we are on uh, land that is Nishnabe land, and we are doing everything we can to, I guess, I am doing everything I can to support the Nishnabe people to assert um, on their lands. Um, we know that there's a certain risk involved in that, and, uh, and we live with that risk every day. And so when we're talking about lateral violence, it becomes really precarious because you're on, on the one hand, you know you're living with these risks every day, that, you're, that you risk to your, your safety or risk to your, your well-being, risk to your everything. You know, you're, you, you've given everything to it, and then all of a sudden... You know, you, you're uh, facing lateral violence on the other hand, so you're just getting pummeled from all over the place. And uh, because online shit is so uh, awful, you, there's no place to really have discussions about what is and what isn't. So you end up just sort of eating it and taking it, you know, time and time again. And it, you know, and at the same time, you're sitting there pushing yourself and doing everything that you can to the point of even exhaustion and breakdown to be able to, to fight and defend. I do want to say, though, that that said, there is, uh, in my mind, and I'm not sure if this is true for how everybody else thinks, but in my mind, so our um, land defense at Nimki Ajbakom is not as intense as what the tiny house warriors are doing or what Kanahos, uh, I mean, what uh, what Zoetin people are doing, you know, the, I recognize the difference in in the intensity of, of the moment, and I recognize how, even though I'm doing what I can over here to the point of exhaustion, I still have to step it up even another notch to support my sister over over there, because because I see that there's great risk to the life and safety of her family and the people that are that are the tiny house warriors. So I still see that my responsibility is not just to me, not just to the people here who I'm working with to, to fight for the lands here and the waters here, but there's also different uh, ceremonies and things that I want to help support in the ways that I can or for the water because there's lots of water walks going on and prayers for those waters are really important. The connection for people to get back to the land and get back to the connected to their animals and their the plants and to understand that all power comes from the land and comes from the plants and the animals. To understand our own spiritual powers which are not being uh, totally um, encouraged all the time for young people to be able to to understand what their own spiritual powers are and how to get in touch with their own helpers i guess through ceremony and fasting so there's all sorts of areas in which we can help to assert our connections to land in a way that will support us all in the long run and that's how i see us all as a as a whole although we're all working in our own areas and then we also have to be prepared to kind of do what we can to support who's in crisis or who's facing the worst of the, of the threats at the moment. So that's sort of um, all the things that quite your question and what the previous speakers had said sort of triggered in my mind. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Christy. Um, thanks for, for bringing in that connection to the land and the animals and 
Yeah, I have some more questions for you, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, Kenna House, uh, the same question for you. Um, how did you know that this work was your calling or your purpose? Hello. Um, I should have my answer all together because everybody was talking, but I was just absorbed into what everyone was talking about um, because you know, as women, I feel like we are connected and by these threads that are the reasons why we stand up, you know, and I came to different realizations throughout my lifetime. Um, I grew up in the movement and I grew up with my grandfather, um, you know, being a leader in our movement for Indigenous rights and title here in our nation and you know, from a local to like an international level. And so I witnessed him on many occasions as a young girl um, speaking in front of thousands of Native people and seeing him get the type of respect that he got and knowing it was for our land and our title and rights. And then, you know, being raised by my father, Arthur Manuel too, it was, it was the same way. And so, but it wasn't that that really pushed me into in my own life being so fully involved. I mean, I dedicated my life now to our movement. Um, it was different occasions. And one of them was us fighting against a massive ski resort development in our mountains. And my father, he was a federal Indian band chief at the time. And he had always encouraged all of his children, me and my sisters and brothers to attend these meetings at our community hall. And I, I went to these community meetings time and time again because um, my father had asked me, um, but also it was a big interest of mine to stand with my aunties and my people in our family who depended on that mountain that was being um, threatened. And one of the elders, she's around 97 now, but she was already an elder on one of the oldest elders on the Skalneth um, Reserve. And she stood up every meeting and sometimes people would you know, oh, here she goes again talking. And, but for me, we've always learned to respect. We brought to meetings time and time again, since we were little kids saying, be quiet, you listen, and you don't make any sounds. And, and so I listened to her every single time, but this time she slammed her fist on the table and she said, where's our warriors? And she looked right at my, in my eyes and I was like gulp. <laughs> I was like, oh, she's looking at me. Um, and I, I, from that day, I end up quitting my job. I end up standing with her. I said, hey, I'll go with you. You want to go house to house? I'll go with you. And so we start going house to house and we start organizing to, in our defense of our mountains. And um, I saw elders um, shut their door on her um, because we wanted to talk about our land and fighting for our land. I mean, it was illegal for us to talk about our land and to organize um, fighting for our land. And so there was still a lot of fear at that time. This was like in the early 2000s and native youth movement in our community was just like, and we were just starting to organize with native youth movement, which really um, sparked a lot of interest in our nation with the youth. And it just, it just went on from there. But I mean, I know that there's sometimes that there's just one incident or one, one um, thing that happens that just imprinted in your life. And you just know that you can't go back and that was that time for me when that elder stared in my eyes and she said and she screamed and she said where's our warriors at and I knew that that was not just her screaming that that was like all of our ancestors that were saying like where's our warriors come on let's stand up and even to this day I still hold that here and you know even in my young life I've seen so many of these really strong frontliners pass away you know, um, Wolverine being one of them, Johnny Guitar, you know, Blaine Sampson, like I could name a whole bunch of them. And sometimes when I'm on the front lines and I'm all alone and I feel all alone and I think about them, you know, I'm like, where's all our fucking, oh, sorry. Um, Frontline blockaders, like all the ones that are hardcore, not scared, you know, and I think about these warriors that I think, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta be the, that warrior now. I gotta be the one that people are um, putting at a standard, like that's how our warriors need to be. And so 
that's an also another thing is to honor all of those front lines, frontliners that were never too scared. And they were actually some of the most brave, courageous people. And a lot of times they were felons and so-called criminals. And they were like the ones that people, you know, look in the community, they were alcoholics and they were like drug users and everything. And those were the frontliners. They sobered up, they went on the front lines. That was what sobered them up. And so, you know, frontline work is, is amazing and it's important and it's needed because it, like, like V says, it intersects. It's not just about land defense. It's about decolonization. It's about mental health. It's about birthing and it's about everything because as indigenous people, we don't separate all of this stuff. It's if for our people and our land, everything is connected. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think for me too, like I have like that one moment also, or like maybe it was like a few months, but uh, for me it was like definitely, I don't know more. Like that was what sparked a lot for me. And it was like, it was like someone like lifted a veil from over my, my eyes and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and yeah, like my life has never been the same. Um, so thanks for, for sharing a little bit about that and um, for, for acknowledging um, the lived experiences of, of folks on the front lines. Um, That's really beautiful. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Sophia. Um, and I want to come back to some of the things you were mentioning before. Um, because I think you're you're right that that indigenous folks that are in urban urban settings can also be frontliners and can also be you know pushing pushing for change and um, there's there's definitely struggles that come with that as well. So could you elaborate a little bit about what it's like to organize in a city um, and some of the the challenges that come with that? Yeah, I think that. Um city and and you know grassroots movements in the city um it's hard finding people to mobilize with i think that was like pretty much the essence of what Sudan was um especially in ottawa i mean we have so many people but they're all government corporate workers that couldn't care less or are on the other side actively you know uh trying to hit us with cars and stuff so um, I think that, uh, you know, city work is really important to bring that light in, but of course there are struggles to doing it in the city and, um, and finding those people that are willing to put themselves in situations that can turn dangerous, that are uncertain, um, that, you know, you're not too sure how the action is going to go. It depends on police presence. It depends on, um, you know, our our blockers and our warriors and how well they're looking out for the group, you know, and how well are they, um, are they seeing, you know, the potential threats coming in. Um, I know that we really um, avoided some situations, some of which a lot of people didn't even know were there, you know, like, if, uh, if the people that you're mobilizing with and the people that are marching or or in a sit-in or whatever type of action you're doing um, don't know the the risk level because you know there are individuals that are already taking it under their wing already you know squashing that potential threat you know telling certain people to leave um, you know some people are you know um, negotiating or or interacting with police and uh, de-escalating the situation or whatnot, you know, like there's so many factors to doing it in the city um, that also happen on the front lines. And of course, on the front lines too, um, at the site, you know, you have a lot of different variants that aren't in the city. So I think for me, it was, it was interesting trying to separate that in my head um, and also learning as I go, because um, you know, like I've been to marches and I've been uh, to to kind of white predominant spaces where the risk is not there, you know, and when we're leading it, the risk is there, the risk is high um, and we have snipers on the roofs and, you know, next thing you know, like I'm face to face with a cop, like 
no, I didn't know that when I was going to the action. And then next thing you know, you know, there's like RCMP helicopters around my house and the cops followed me home. And like, it was just like nuts. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really hard to tell how much, um, how much it's going to escalate, you know, um, and for Indigenous peoples, it can escalate to death. I think that's, the, the essence of, of the movement is a lot of people, like kind of who said, a lot of people die and not all of them die from natural causes or whatnot, you know, like it can be PTSD from the front lines. Um, it can be, you know, a cop, you know, and in, uh, in my situation, I'm from Metapanagia and Rodney Levi got shot by a cop uh, from a wellness check. And, um, you know, our community is really small and and uh, and everyone knew everyone, so it's uh, it's really hard to to kind of process that that even people that just wanted help or people that are you know good citizens that weren't even on the front lines or whatever, um, not speaking out, and they still get that police beating, that that police violence, that colonial violence, and we've all kind of face that I think like as indigenous peoples on some degree you've you've faced colonial violence um but I think another thing too is understanding and and labeling what colonial violence is I think a lot of our people don't necessarily realize that so much of our problems stem from colonialism and stem from capitalism uh because you know if you talk to some of the people at least you know uh, people I've talked to, you know, like a lot of them don't even know um, where their problems stem from, you know, they have a lot, they have a lot of problems, but they don't label it in their head as colonialism, they don't say that's the government's fault, that's colonizers fault, you know, like they say that's my fault, that's my family's fault, that's, that's chief and council's fault or whatever, but, you know, you need to kind of always go back to the link, and where did that come from, and you know, almost all the time, it comes from colonizers. It's come, it comes from contact, and it comes from the government and their their policies working on us. You know, as we speak, even if they're not in place or you know not active or whatnot. Like the Indian Act is a great example. Like it doesn't matter that some of the acts aren't active they still they still impose on our everyday lives and how we see each other as people and and um, and how we label each other too within indigenous communities so you know and that comes too in the city and that comes too when when you're mobilizing in a city um and you're trying to recognize urban natives and and res natives and you know all the different categories we we put ourselves in and trying to keep the movement safe but at the same time not excluding people um and it's uh it's hard you know trying to um to be very very inclusive but at the same time making sure our people are safe and there's no gaslighting or there's no uh, potential threat or infiltration in the movement um so you know, city is a really interesting place because you have a lot of non-Indigenous peoples trying to mobilize with you. Um, and that for Indigenous peoples, you kind of have to guard yourself a little bit, like how much do I, do I let them know versus, you know, how much do I let them organize? Do I trust them that way? Um, and, you know, most times it's yes, but there have been instances where we've had to turn people away, where you know, I won't tell someone what exactly we're doing or what the plan is or whatever, because, you know, I, I just, I don't know you that way. And it's not like a personal attack, but I think we need to understand that there is a political significance um, and that, you know, that it's not a personal thing, it's more a political thing. And, and you know, just accepting that reality that this is a really high risk situation. Um, and you know, letting indigenous peoples lead the way, and uh, I'm glad that that wasn't uh, a main component when we were um, on the front lines in Ottawa. But 
I've known many different places where that was the case, where they had many conflicts on the front lines because, you know, there were predators or there were uh, people that weren't trusted in the community. And it's hard because you don't want to put people in that situation, but at the same time, warriors are warriors and we got to protect our people. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll let someone else build on that, I guess. Thanks, Sophia. Um, yeah, I wanted to just mention that, you know, like I was there on some of those instances you were talking about with like snipers and riot police and those kind of things. And um, I just wanted to say that, like, you know, it's scary, but I would have never thought that you felt scared because you're just so confident and, you know, always like in a graceful way. And that goes to all of you, you know, like I see you on social media and um, I think that's a really awesome thing that young people can look to you all for is um, to not feel so scared and to, to look to you as role models in that way. Um, so that's what your thoughts were, were making me think or your uh, insight was making me think about. Um, but I'll go to V. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on some of the work I've been watching you do in community and in in Edmonton and um, this really like this really like tough place to organize in. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, that there is um, racism and specifically anti-blackness within indigenous communities and that can make organizing with with indigenous folks and other folks really that much more challenging and so I wanted to ask you what are some of like the best practices you've seen or been a part of when trying to mobilize indigenous black and brown folks that's an excellent question. Um, I guess like an example I would like draw from is, uh, you know, coming from an immigrant family where uh, political consciousness is very different. Like the worldview in, you know, a lot of like immigrant families, especially refugee families like myself is very, can be very insular because of trauma. So it's sometimes it's like really hard to like, you, like I can't like always force my, my grandparents to like open the door on things that they don't feel comfortable talking about. But uh, I, I, finding ways to establish trust is very important. Um, I, I, like this last summer, really like this past summer really tested my ability to like be patient and understanding and compassionate, especially uh, with the action that we did in the inner city. So we basically like reoccupied uh, treaty crown land that's just in like in downtown Edmonton. And we, it took months of planning <laughs> to try and strategize how can we utilize uh, treaty rights to create space for any inner city houseless people particularly like indigenous people who are displaced on the streets. And, you know, a lot of folks have been living on the streets for like 30 years since they were like teenagers. A lot of them, you know, residential school survivors, 60s scoop and uh, have a very different worldview. Like don't always understand gender or they have, uh, they understand these complexities because of their own lived experience, but may not have the language. So it was a lot of like, being able to use language that is accessible, like not everyone understands what intersectionality is. You know, I cannot, uh, it would be it would be very difficult for me to explain that to a non-English speaker, <laughs> like immigrant or indigenous, you know what I mean? So uh, like taking the time to just like get to know somebody where they're at, even when they're saying, when they're being indirectly bigoted, meaning that like, they may not be intentionally trying to be harmful, but what they're saying could be harmful, especially when it would come to like, uh, you know, xenophobia or anti-blackness and home, like all the things, right? So meeting people where they're at and just like uh, finding ways to switch, kind of position the conversation, not as a, an attack on folks who are being indirectly bigoted, but just like 
if someone would say, you know, something about, oh, the immigrants are stealing all the jobs, <laughs> like things like that, I'd be like, oh, you know, it must have been really hard coming from a country that's like being exploited or, you know, uh, or where there's war happening, right? Just like finding ways to like create that conversation, you know, but that takes time too. So yeah, like being able to, I don't know, just patience, building trust, right? And what's beautiful about that is that, you know, you're build, it's building intergenerational trust, you know, with people who have very unique lived experiences with whatever, like with, you know, such as like all the things I brought up earlier. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of folks like they have their own stories too, you know, and I want to be able to hear what they have to say because I don't know what they went through and they probably see something that I don't see. Right. So, but when it comes to like, and this can also apply to like privileged, like indirect bigoted, like, like white people or just, you know, settlers and settler people of color that, you know, chose to come to this country and are very conscious of the impact that they're having, where such as like, you know, they, like I'm talking like specifically people that just don't care, you know, I don't even know, like there's just some people who are not gonna change their minds or have their minds set already on, you know, and how, what, who they think Indigenous people are, First Nations people are, and like how they live on their own lands or just, and they're I, it being, I've had to figure out the skill of differentiating between who do I want to spend my time educating, you know, um, uh, uh, Indigenous people or uh, immigrant folks and black folks who may not have access to the resources and information, but, you know, are also like wanting to like have open conversations or do I want to waste my time talking to petrofascists <laughs> and people that actively do not like agree with our existence, you know? So uh, it, like, it's, it's like a, a balance, you know, trying to figure out like who, you know, and I think that also comes from like being disabled and not having a lot of compassion spoons to like give out to folks. So it's really figuring out like, I don't know, you just I, like, you got to trust your intuition a little bit <laughs> when it comes to these things, right? But first and foremost, like, I think I will always try and take the time to you know, speak to folks who aren't being directly impacted by the things that they might not understand, you know, like, it, maybe it's not immigrants, maybe it's just white supremacy. <laughs> right. So yeah, I guess that's kind of, that's kind of, yeah, that's what I have to say about that, unless I've missed anything or glossed over anything. <laughs> Yeah, and like if anything comes to mind, like feel free to bring it up in in other uh, responses. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, there's so many um, there's so many things that really impact our lives that we're never actually taught about. Like we're never taught about white supremacy in school. <laughs> like that's something we have to figure out on our own <laughs> eventually. And some of us never actually uh, figure out how to name that. Um, so yeah, patience and trust, like that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Christy and Kanahos. Maybe I'll start with Kanahos. Um, and so I feel like people really see you as like this really amazing warrior, which you are, but I really want to know, like, what is it, what is it like, like living off the land, like in a non like romanticized perspective like what is it really like so yeah kind of my question is what is it what does your day-to-day -day life look like and and um what kind of joy does it bring you um, well first of all i would like to say that that there's there's different ways that i have lived off the land or been connected and living on the land during my 
my time in the movement and and it really started I guess when I very first started going to the land and you know our, our blockades were on the land and in the mountains um, it was really about finding the knowledge because you could be walking on your food you could be trampling on the very food that you're meant to eat all the light all the lichen on the trees all the moss all the all the roots you know all the mushrooms all the things that that you don't even know you can eat and it it you i had to really embark on a major learning experience because we weren't raised that way my father was a residential school survivor my my mother like Christy was saying about the status, they got their status pulled from them. My, my mother was one of those people that got her status pulled from her, um, but was raised by her, her grandmother. But by that time, it was still real reservation life. It was pulled off of the, we were pulled off of the territory. And just to throw this number again, if you take all the, all the Indian reserves and add them up, it's 0.2% of land base. So all of our indigenous people are, are, are either living on that 0.2% of our land base on the current Indian reserves or are forced um, like our, our Indian reserve and community, I think around two thirds live off reserve in urban settings because there's just no housing in our communities. And so living off the land, how do you do that? And, and what does it give me? Well, living off the land was a real struggle because you're saying, you're coming from a like really a colonized mentality that we dependent on the white man for our food, our clothes, and our shelter. You know, or we're dependent on them for going to the grocery store, buying the food from them. Uh, my father was wasn't a hunter, but you know, every once in a while that he went out with his Chilcotin friends and he was able to come back and bring home a moose, but it was very rare. And so um embarking um on this whole land back movement was a big chore. And I had to seek out the elders to learn this knowledge. And, and uh, the partner I had, um, the father of all four of my children, he grew up in the city and he was a city boy, grew up in New York City actually. And I said, you're gonna be with me. You gotta learn everything you can about being a Bushman. <laughs> so turn a city boy into a Bushman. Um, during those four, but during those four children that I had, but he became uh, a builder. He built me a traditional pit house, an underground pit house. So I'm like, this is the house that I want built for me. Um, and we worked on that, and it was it was a lot of sacrifice on on my part because I'm saying, okay, go dig this hole for three months, so we can have a pit house for the winter. Go and leave me and the kids, and go harvest this wood for the, another three months. You know, and so that's like taken away from me and my family and the responsibilities of our core and learning what to eat, learning how to sap trees, learning how to, you know, eat a lot of different foods that I, I, I never thought that I would even, you could even eat or they don't even taste like what we would say is good. You know, we would have to decolonize our taste buds and everything. Um, but yeah, it, it was hard. But one of the things that that I did learn is, is that by being able to, I have I have seven puppies here, you guys. <laughs> so that's a year little barking going on in the background. That's like seven puppies that were born in this tiny house a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, the land back movement, and and now I, I I always say this too that before when I was raising my children, I was living in an underground pit house. I was able to harvest all my food. That was one of the things I I committed to was like eating all my foods harvested off the land, which takes 100% of your time. You don't have time to be somewhat steward or acting like the white man. You don't have time to be watching TV. You don't have time to be laying in a couch. In fact, you don't even own a couch because you don't lay down and sit, lay on a couch. You don't have time for that. You're constantly harvesting food, putting food away, but it's your life and it's fun because when you get to sit in the middle of the winter and you get to you know enjoy all the all the wealth and the fruits of your labor and the land you get to eat those huckleberries you get to eat those mushrooms and everything you know and you have this sense of dependent like independence you know like that that you're fighting back and um, my father ingrained this in me like that's a part of colonization is the dependency that you have 
And so food um, security and food sovereignty is a big part of who we are as a movement because we have to um, be able to depend on ourselves. If we want to have a sovereign nation, we have to be able to feed ourselves. And if that means supplementing off of organic gardens, that's also a means. And I supported that as well with Wolverine and, and his gardens that he was literally grew tons of, of squash and tons of potatoes and tons of, of carrots and onions and garlic. And he gave it away to the front lines, he gave it away to young families. He, he grew it to show that we can, you know, live without depending on the white man for, for those things. And one of the things that I know now too, as, you know, committing my life to just completely land, land back, living on the land, to now how I am on the front line. My every waking hour is on the front line, it's fighting a pipeline. I don't have time the way I used to have time. So I appreciate when people who are out picking huckleberries say, hey, kind of who's here's a couple of jars of huckleberries. I saw you were on the front lines, you know, the whole summer and you didn't have any time to get off. You know, here's some jars of salmon because I know what you're doing is defending that salmon. That means so much to me. More than anything, you know, like to, to have um, people who harvest food on the land to appreciate our stance as frontline and connecting the dots that, that this is why we're here on the ground. It's not just for us, it's for everything. It's for those salmon, it's for the huckleberries, it's for everything that we depend on on the land. And the reason why I'm here, like people say like, I'll die and I'll kill for huckleberries. You know, like like huckleberries, just this little beautiful mountain black huckleberry that is so beautiful and juicy. That's what people are fighting for. So that's the connection of what we have for to our land and the love we have for our foods and our land. So connected. So thank you. Yeah, I feel like that's when you know someone really loves you and they give you like their their freshly picked raspberries or blueberries. Man, I can't wait till the summer. <laughs> um, but I'll pass that over to Christy. Uh, what about you? What does it look like, like your day to day life on the land? Um, and uh, what what joys does it bring you? Well, I, I just really appreciate everything that Ken who's just said, because I could really identify with with a lot of that. Like, um, you know, the the process of so I was raised in the city. And when I was, uh, when my daughter was just, uh, just born, I was working at a, an office and I and I told my partner, um, I said, I, I can't do this. I, I don't want her to have to struggle so hard to feel connected to the land of her ancestors, the way that I've had to sort of struggle through the re reclamation process. So I said, let's, uh, let's make the move up to your, your ancestral lands. And, and um, so we did, which is how I ended up in this, this region that I'm living in. And um, so we purposely built our house up on this mountain um, in the Lacloche mountain range, uh, right beside his dad's house and his dad and mom's house. And in that process in the winter time, like we had to haul our water and we, you know, had to haul, like it was, uh, you couldn't drive up. So you had to pay attention to the seasons, the temperatures, you're always watching the weather. That's one thing I learned from that, that old man. He just passed away, he's 96 uh, this year. But he really taught us to watch the weather and to make sure that you're paying attention to what's coming ahead. And that's when I learned, and especially being on the land now at New Kiyajvakong, it's you, you live by the seasons and by the weather and by the daylight and by this, the what's ready to harvest. Like the blueberries don't wait for you. You know, they, they, when they're ready, they're ready. You got to go. And, you know, when you're, and, and when you're trying to, um, live like that it takes up like Kanahus is saying all your your whole your whole everything becomes about food and then you start to really understand your ancestors a lot better you start to really understand how 
how, well, first of all, just goddamn tough they were, how tough and strong and ingenious and, you know, about preserving food and making sure there was enough for the winter and like to, to harvest enough food for you and your family for the whole winter long is so much work like in this the spring the summer the fall you know and then you got to preserve that and so your you know your whole life is is becomes about survival so i have learned being on the land how that how just the the calendar of of uh i guess the what is it called the gregorian calendar and the and the clock so the nine to five and the Gregorian calendar con conflicts with life on the land. And at some point, you know, it, it's, you make the decision for yourself, which one's gonna win? Because the, what we run into at the camp a lot is people will say, well, can't you hold this workshop on, on a weekend? Or can't you, you know, like I, can't you do it on a long weekend? And it's like, well, actually tanning a hide to, takes two, you know, it's gonna be two weeks straight. So, uh, and what about goose hunting? What about this? What about hunting and harvesting? And, you know, when somebody gets a moose, they get a moose, everything, you drop everything and you're there helping to cut up that moose or that deer or whatever. And even if it takes you into the wee hours, into the next day, and then you're smoking it or you're canning it or you're freezing it or whatever you're doing, you know, takes, uh, it's backbreaking work and everybody scatters when it comes to that. And it's just always a core group of people who are sitting there, uh, you know, spending those hours upon hours and then waking up the next day and doing it all again. Your life goes completely on hold, but there, there is the connection to that moose that you get or that deer or the fish or whatever it is that you're working on that is so profound and so deep and it, you just feel your grandmothers with you, you know? And then you think about our babies, you know, and our children. I'm always, uh, I'm always thinking about like, why did I leave the city was so that my daughter could be raised with blueberries outside her door, the, so that we could see the deer and hear the wolves and go for walks and not be around anybody and be on the land and so that she could have those connections it, it takes it, you know, it takes a lot to do it, but there's the reward is just, you know, who you are. You stand with both your feet really firmly planted. You feel confidence in who you are. And having that um, sovereignty of food sovereignty is one of the most important things and birthing and understanding how we as um the one, some of the, you know, some of us who are life givers can provide that nurturing and connection that we have to the earth and to the waters is so strong within us that our protection of our next generations just kicks in like we're all mama bears or, or aunties or something that are just ready to, you know, fight for what we, what we know that we need to provide for our families and for our communities in the future. So there, but, but, you know, then you're sitting in the bush, like I was the last summer and I was sitting there and I was looking at these mushrooms and then all of a sudden I saw the light come through. It was, the sun was going down and I realized that there was all these little tiny gold threads of spider webs everywhere. And, and, you know, you're watching the light flicker on these spider webs. And then you, all of a sudden, it's like, you realize this, there's a whole communication happening and the smell of the, of the, of the forest, you know, the smell of that earth that you're, when you're sitting on that earth, there's nothing like it. And this is the way we're meant to be by living by the seasons, living by the, the weather, understanding that we, we need to live in conjunction with the spirits that are the fabric of this earth. And to do that takes all of your time. And it's a good life, you know, it's a humble life. It's a hardworking life, but it's a good life. And so that's what I wanna say is I, uh, this earth, it's easy to protect it when you love it so much. Thanks.
Thanks so much for, for sharing those perspectives with us. Um, I hope it gives everyone that that's listening right now a little bit more perspective of why people are on the front lines and why people dedicate themselves to this way of living because it's, it's really so beautiful. Um, but I think um, I want to talk about a little bit of a I don't know, I guess it might be a little bit of a sensitive topic or a touchy topic, but I think it's really important that we address it. Um, you know, when we, I think that all of you, we all put ourselves in really vulnerable situations. Um, and not that, not that the work that we're doing is vulnerable, but because of colonization and capitalism, um, we're, we're more susceptible to harm, um, especially when we're on the front lines. And so that means that sometimes uh, like harmful people can come into the movements and it, it has happened, uh, unfortunately. And so I wanna kind of pass that topic and question on to you, Kenna House is um, what are some of the struggles being a woman on the front lines that might be really different that, that a cis male would experience? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have like so much different examples that I can touch on. Um, well, specifically since I start organizing as a Native youth mm -hmm. and being just young. And um, <clears throat> at that time, it seemed like it was more, uh, more machismo even then than it is now. And so we grew up in an era where it was big chief. <laughs> Our movement was like a real big chief type of feel to it um, because they, well, for us, it, it included the elected federal chief and council type of system. Whenever there was any type of blockade, if you wanted any type of support for the blockade, you would go to chief and council, you support us for this blockade. Oh yeah, we've got chief and council support. Now we don't need to, we don't need to do that for our movements. And um, um, I hope that person that left this <laughs> wasn't offended by my treatment council stuff. No, I'm just playing. But um, I, I feel that, that it's wherever you go, you're going to find this. And, and I feel with Tiny House Warriors, we created a space where it's not welcome. It's not welcome in our space to come. No cis male is going to come here and feel like they have a space to, you know, be loud and proud and and take up their space like they always want to take up. They come here and they're like, oh, there's just uh, females and thems, <laughs> two spirit, and ooh, I sort of sneak back here and I take my spot in the background, <laughs> and that's sort of where it has gone now. And I'm just being honest with it in our movement and spaces. I mean, there's other movements that are fighting you know, or in groups in different areas fighting pipelines, other places, and they might be, oh, we put this big chief in here and that's gonna be our symbol and that's how we're gonna stop the pipeline. Um, that's not the way that we've been. And my father, he was always stood beside me all the time and he, and people may look at him and he was a big male and he was, you know, stood his ground and his had his place and he never had to deal with what we had to deal with. No, he saw firsthand how people treated his daughters they cupped his twin daughters together with his wife, my mom in the middle of us. That's the way that they looked at us in the movement. They didn't go to my dad as being a federal Indian band chief and come on, Arthur, we arrest you, you're coming with us. Even though he was doing the exact same things as us, he was standing on the roads just like us, but the way that he is treated, you know, how he was treated compared to the way that we're treated. And so now, learning all those experiences of what we had to deal with because then we had males, our own natives, men go against us in native youth movement when we're fighting against Sun Peak Ski Resort. And then of course, mainstream media loved that and they played on that and pitting native people against each other and saying, oh, this chief and council is against the native youth protests, you know, and this chief is against this and, and really making it look like that. And I think that even now during this pipeline fight, we have um, 
one former federal Indian band chief, uh, Shane Godfordson, and, and one that's actually a current, I don't know if he's a current, but they're both former Sukhwatmuk federal band chiefs that are saying that they're going to be buying a portion of this pipeline. I mean, that's those are the types of um, men that we're dealing with um, on the front lines. And, and um, you know, it's dangerous. It's really dangerous because when you have people like that, that people really look at as legitimate people that are openly speaking against young Indigenous female land defenders, it puts them in danger. It puts them in danger from more aggression from other people that, that have any type of opposition to us for whatever reason. And one of the things that I'll mention here is that a lot of Native people who've been beat down their whole life and when things like this come in the news where, oh, Native people are standing up and fighting against the pipeline. Um, some Native people that have white friends or their kids are in school surrounded by all white children will start going against us, you know, and standing with the enemy. And we see that time and time again, where our own people are going against us. And it's not because we are um, not doing what's right and upholding our rights and our title to our land and our responsibility to Creator and to Kalkukbi. Um, it's because of colonization. It's because of their you know, fear of uh, retaliation or they're not proud enough to stand up and know the real reasons of why we are here. Um, so those are some other things that I see. Um, and we see those people, those men that are, they find those men, the media will find those men to be a voice in opposition to us. So it'll look like, oh, this man is standing here and he's against these indigenous females here. And that's not right. But I think that by creating these spaces, like our, how we have at this tiny house warrior village, um, where we create these safe spaces for um, young indigenous, people, fams, two-spirit, trans, to come here and actually have a voice, actually have a safe space where they can be and actually organize. And that's one of the things that we do is it here as we encourage people to get educated while they're here. Let's continue to talk at the campfire, get educated. So when they go off, they can organize in Vancouver, they could organize in Edmonton, they could organize all throughout wherever they're coming from on the pipeline route and to build our skills up and empower our young people. And, and that's why we like to create these spaces because we didn't have these spaces. We had these spaces where these cis, cis men come in and then it silences the ones that actually had a voice and were actually speaking and organizing and feeling confident. And I don't want to, I want to make our, all of our people feel um, safe and I feel that a lot of young, young men, Indigenous men that are coming into our movement, acknowledge it and say, I'm going to step back here and I'm going to create this space so you guys can have this, you know? And I, that's what I appreciate too, uh, as well. Um, it's time we do. And it's, um, I think that our young Indigenous BAMs, Two Spirit and Trans are some of the most fiercest organizers today, right now happening out here in, in Indian country. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, some of the, the most deadliest warriors I know are women and femmes and two-spirit folks and gender diverse folks. So yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe I'll pass it over to Sophia. Um, you can even share like some, some best practices you've seen um but also some some of the struggles you might face as a a, a femme identifying person um, or woman um in these in these movements thanks um yeah just like backing off what uh kind of who said you know it's uh it's a lot to try and balance that uh the roles that that are in our community and I think a lot of the times within our community and outside our community uh, people think warriors are men you know period warriors are men where are our warriors at and they look to the men um, they never well not never but most times don't look to women um, and 
and even you know like they'll look at women as perhaps the healers of the aftermath of the war or or the um you know the life givers that we have to protect or whatnot but they never look at women as the people on the front lines on the the people that will stand up for the people um etc you know and for me that that happens a lot where where i'm from um it's very much a gendered approach where it's men are warriors women are not that's it um or even if they do recognize you know and and some people do okay yeah women can be warriors and they are um there's a lot of sexualization that happens on the front lines and and young women are are, are being preyed upon and um, holding predators accountable for um, for going after Indigenous youth, um, Indigenous femmes, two-spirited uh, peoples, you know, there's a lack of accountability um, because they're top chief, you know, or what, whatever, like, especially if they're in those types of positions where they have power in the community, um, especially if the entire situation is tense and everyone is feeling emotions and then and then you try and bring that up to you know on top of the colonialism and capitalism and the police threats oh by the way this person harassed me or by the way you know like this person has been really damaging to our movement uh for our women and because our women are warriors a lot of the time we don't talk about it we just whatever you know i dealt with it on my own and and that's it you know i'm gonna try and push it down or just wait till it's over until the until the fight is over and then i'm just gonna go to a different front line but that's not how we deal with things you know because that person is still gonna be there on the front lines to wherever you left them and they might follow you you know to different front lines so um there's a lot of risk in that sense too that even our own people um, attack our people that way and they might not even know that it's attacking they just might you know whatever like I wasn't I wasn't attacking you I just thought you were prettier you know but like that that type of situation on the front lines can be really damaging to to youth and um, and to people who um, are viewed as really traditional um, and even you know off of the front lines, but just in our communities and that lateral violence um, that happens and not being believed when you speak up about it or nothing being done when you do um, is really, really prominent because, you know, it's all about families and, oh, what you say about my son? No, that didn't happen. My son would never do that or my daughter would never do that or, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a highly politically charged situation. Um, and just our everyday lives is a political situation just because of where we're at on reserve. Um, and of course, I can't speak to all reserves because every every reserve and every community has their own issues and their own, you know, relationship with colonialism and how it's affected them. But um, but I know for me, like, um, it was it was pretty hard because also there was there is warrior shaming, like that's what I call it. There's probably a better word for it, but people don't want to be labeled as warriors where I'm from. They think it's like a really radical situation and and they, you know, or they label warriors wrong. <laughs> uh, so like, you know, they, they might not necessarily be on the front lines or just like a figurehead and they'll call like some cis man, a, a warrior, um, just because he has a headdress on but you know like we I think we all need to recognize that traditional roles are are really prominent in our communities and we lost that at least you know in Mi'kmaq like we lost a lot of our traditional roles and and I always tell people I say look like if you're gonna go down a legal road um, you know you're gonna take this to court or whatever you're going to pursue different avenues that's okay you know like I'm not saying don't do that what I'm saying is you need to utilize the warriors that you have especially if it impacts all of us and you know there's no shame in doing both and 
everyone has a different role you know we have healers and and matriarchs you know and we have educators and and researchers and then you have the warriors and the leaders and you know we all have a role but for some reason you know we we kind of pinpoint against each other within our own communities well no we don't want to put a blockade we want to take them to court well no you know like we need to not talk to the media or we need to talk to the media and um there's so many different opportunities that first nations and 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 just indigenous peoples can utilize in their situations but um but you know we don't want we don't want warriors involved because then that brings it up to a different level and we don't want to escalate the situation when really that's probably how we're going to figure out the situation you know and you need warriors in those discussions and those negotiations and those um backdoor meetings um to ensure that people are being protected and that deals aren't just made and then you have a blockade because you didn't talk to your people um which happens so so often across Canada or so-called Canada you know like it just happens all the time where you never hear about a situation again and like a lot of people are like what Sudan is done you know they signed the MOU no that's not where it ended and what Sudan like the CGL pipeline wasn't included in the MOU um so the fight is still on it's still on the territory and then you're like, they're like what um so there's just so many levels to violence within our communities and outside our communities. And um, yeah, like definitely being um, a woman or a femme or two-spirited person um, on the front lines is a different experience because you're already exposed to so much violence. Um, and then you have to deal with either police or or the media kind of painting you as a, I don't know, like just sexualizing you. Um, and then within the movement, people sexualizing you. Um, and then just trying to focus on the movement when all of this is happening. Um, so I don't really have many best practices, but um, I always say like, to resolve that in that movement because that person is probably going to go to the next movement um and and you need warriors to protect warriors you know and what we don't need is cops protecting cops <laughs> so you kind of need to have a mentality where if someone is being abused or hurt or whatever we need to protect that warrior as warriors and and if it comes to you know kicking someone out or or educating them or taking them to an elder or whatever like there's so many ways where we can heal our people and have that opportunity to really have a meaningful uh dialogue or or you know just deal with the situation but what you can't do is just let it manifest itself and and affect so many other people where they don't even want to be on the front lines anymore um, and it's not because of the external factors, it's internal factors that are prohibiting them to be on the front lines. Um, so that's what I'll say about that. And probably um, V or Christy will have more to say about that. Thanks, Sophia. Um, yeah, I think that that's unfortunately um, how abusers operate. You know, it's it's not just um a personal thing like it's not like they're just uh, being inappropriate with one person and it's between those two it's like a reoccurring behavior you know and they do it again and again um until you know hopefully there's some kind of restoration process or justice that happens um so i'll pass it over to you christy um what are some of your thoughts around that, around uh, and even some best practices that you might have come across um, dealing with, uh, you know, this like a, maybe abusers or um, violence within the movement from as a woman? There's uh, so much that's been said that I agree with and appreciate so much. 
And uh, there's so much that I could say on this subject, but you know, we're, we're counting down the clock. So I'll try and be as concise as I possibly can. Um, so I have faced sexual violence my whole life and been a victim of sexual violence, including um, from ceremonial, a ceremonial elder. And, um, and that, you know, really shaped my way of thinking. And also being the age that I am, I'm not exactly sometimes like, so I'll give you an example, like at the camp, we did have somebody that came into the camp who was um, exhibiting like inappropriate uh, behavior towards a 16 year old. And they there were 28. And um, like my like anti vibes or whatever, like we're all over that. And I was like, something's going on there. Like they had just come into the camp that day. And I was like, why are they talking to one another? Like, it's very not, there's something there that I'm not, um, you know, not, not really like something's going on. So then um, I went away and I came because that 16 year old was there with a chaperone. So I was like, okay, well, they're there with a chaperone and like, I'm not at the camp all the time. And despite the fact that it looks like there's like only a couple people that are in leadership, it, that's not how the camp works. It works like the whole group, which is a very small group. It's not a large group. Um, anyway, that person, to cut the story short, because of the exhibiting that um, behavior towards that 16 year old, um, I consulted with the two grandmothers that were there and I consulted with somebody else on the phone and I said, Hey, this person is really acting not good and we need to like get rid of him. So um, it was put on my shoulders to go tell him like, you have to leave the camp. This is a decision that was made. Um, this, uh, it, you know, this is like sexual predatorship like if you are not aware of why this is wrong then you need to figure out why it is wrong and if you can't figure this out then you're going to be known as a sexual predator for the rest of your life and you need to check this out and you have two kids at home go go take care of your kids like this is gross what you're doing but anyway you're not allowed to come to the camp so then uh he he left under protest but he left and i then warned the people within the areas where I knew that he had been before. And that's a problem that some of these predators like will go camp to camp. They'll go like to, because they're not known maybe out in BC or out wherever. So they'll like leave the region where people know who they are and they'll go somewhere else. So I called up um, some people that I know in um, so-called BC and I told them hey here's a photograph of the guy he might show up I called up some other people where I knew he was like frequenting like he was trying to get he was getting into like a Medewan lodge and I was like okay well I called those people up and I said this is why this person was asked to leave the camp and then I found out um, a year later uh, that he had sexually assaulted somebody at the camp so it was like uh, you know a at that time, uh, like we didn't, like nothing was told to us about that. So this person was uh, able to be at the camp. He wasn't there full time or anything. It was just sort of on and off. So it was like very like uh, horrible that him and another person had been uh, preying upon or interested in or whatever you want to say. Um, young people at two spirit people at the camp that we were not aware of that until like way after the person had been asked to leave the camp. So in those situations, like the support of the person who's been um, attacked or abused or whatever, or preyed upon has to be there, including their talking to them to understand to what degree do they wish to pursue or to do whatever because people have autonomy and control and the rights to say what they want done with their own story and their own body. In one of the cases, the, the person uh, didn't 
absolutely under no circumstances told us we were not allowed to speak about it. That, that they said, this is my story. It's rape culture. If you participate in talking about my story, it's up to me and I don't want, nobody has a right to talk about it. So in that case, our hands were like uh, tied in a way. And we were then, so, then in the past two years, uh, since then, uh, I've been accused of being a rape apologist, of, of all sorts of things that just absolutely are, are untrue. And the person who meanwhile has committed this assault, who has done this thing, who's, a, who's running around being supported to be going to ceremonies and all of these things by people in the community that are not part of my community, but, but elsewhere, you know, and, and even though I made it known to them what this person had done, he's still being welcomed into those circles. So, you know, and at the same time, the online violence is like through the damn roof coming towards me. And yet I've, you know, done everything in my power to tell people and warn people about him. And this is like, it's really upsetting because at the same time, the online just shit if you say anything all of a sudden you know it's like oh you're trying to deflect or defend or whatever so you know you're just you're stuck you know with your hands tied in the meantime at the same time you know you've got all of these other pressures on you to make sure everybody is okay and to make sure you know the people that depend on you in your life are okay and are the young people who who you you know you're an auntie to are they okay where they are in the cities or on the land or whatever, you know, and you're doing all of this. And then at the same time, you're facing this online violence, which are absolute lies and untruths. And how do you, how do people discern from those untruths? How do people discern what's true and what isn't true? You know, and I know that, I know that what I've seen, there's been one person particularly who's been vindictive, like in a way that's been like just illogical towards coming after me like every week it seems like there's something new put up there and oh it's just the the amount of lies are laughable you know but they're just they're unreal and this same person has gone after uh molly wickham in wetsotin canahus has gone after you gabriella the same person has gone after everybody in a mostly women in a very, very vindictive way online with this violence and nobody's been able to call them out on it. And this is the kind of shit that we have to face when we're sitting there facing the risk of violence to ourselves all the time, just being indigenous women, the risk of what we're doing on the land to protect the lands and standing up there, sometimes putting our bodies on the line, the risk of what we're doing to our, our, ourselves in terms of our mental health, our mental well-being, and our physical health, because it takes a lot out of you to be able to do all of this. And then at the same time, trying to protect the people that are, that are around you, and then being shit on online, and not being able to, do, to say anything or do anything about it is absolute the epitome of bullshit that I've ever seen. And so this is what I'm wondering, is how do we you know, address this, because once we talk about this, then we're exposing it to the broader white gaze. And we can't talk about this online, even on here, because then people are going to say, ooh, that camp has a bunch of, you know, it, it's just, it's just the, the bullshit that goes on with the gossip. You know, <laughs> like one of the things we have to address is the gossip. And being able to say, no, 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 people are not these terrible people. They're, they're not, you know, like you can't make a decision on who a person is based on your impression of them in one time or their Twitter account or whatever it is, because social media is a lie and we know it is. And it doesn't reflect the nuances of who people are. And I just... I, I don't know how to, you know, what the best practices are in this, because I'm currently like trying to just understand how I am supposed to carry on with everything that I'm doing, which I am going to carry on with, but at the same time, just not even responding to that, and then taking all these hits on the side, like I just don't know what the best practices are. The, all I can say is 
as as a person who's older, I keep my eye out. Um, you know, I know that one out of every 10 men are sexual predators. I know that that means that men within our families and our groups are sexual predators. I know that my, me myself has been a victim of sexual assault from as a child, as a young teenager, as an older teenager, as a young woman. This has been an ongoing thing in my life. So my eyes are always like looking out for why is that person talking to that person? And how, you know, what's going on there? And, you know, like, and it becomes really hard to have to, you know, make sure without a, a lot of support, I suppose, that people are going to be safe. And the only thing that we can do is we can continue to expose the person the, or the people that are responsible for, for that. And at the same time, respect the people's wishes who are the victims so that they are feel like they're in control of their own story and their own body. And um, this is something that we have to face all the time in addition to the threats to our safety and our well-being coming from the outside. So those are the things, I don't have any answers really. It's, it's much more complicated than any of us can really solve in a day, but it's um, something that we do have to talk about in a way that doesn't be pointing fingers at people that, that are trying their very damn best and also pointing fingers at the exact perpetrators of the violence. And this is where it becomes really hard, but uh, I'll leave it there. I think I've gone on a little bit too long, but you know, you, okay, thanks Gabby, you got me worked up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I learned my interview skills from is Alanisa Bamsulim. <laughs> so Alanis, like she just like asks you these deadly questions and then she just like stares at you. <laughs> and then like it just makes you like go on and on. <laughs> but yeah, shout out to Alanis, who's also just another deadly role model that we have. Um but as you were talking, I was thinking about like how important whisper networks are. And so like they call it like whisper networks, but it's really just like um, aunties and 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 aunties and <laughs> those like protectors of young people that that have no other way to really share what you were talking about, like share about these abusers and um, I guess like for lack of a better word, creeps. Um, but, you know, we kind of keep, you're right, like we do keep touch, we do keep track of like who's talking to who and like, if like we notice like someone we work with is becoming close to someone that has been red flagged, we we let them know and um, whisper networks, I think really keep people alive. Um, you know, it's, it's like that proactive measure. Unfortunately, we we can only share information and that may that then allows the person to make an informed decision, but we can't decide how that person will move forward um, with their relationships with someone. But, uh, you know, we, we do we do try our best, like you were saying, Christy. Um, I think like another really awesome thing we can do is continue to amplify the voices of femmes, of two spirit folks, of women, like all of you on the panel tonight that are doing that amazing work. And I, I really, really feel that the more we amplify those voices, the less we're putting our energy into um problematic people um and it's like a proactive measure in another way too um so those are things like i've been thinking about uh lately like on how to address it in a little in little ways and you're right it's so complex like there's so many different ways that we need to approach these situations and yeah like the lateral violence is is really really harmful um yeah and sorry v like, <laughs> i want to pass it over to you as well um to answer that that question um and and specifically as a non-binary person um what i'm sure there's even things that you experience each struggles that you experience that cis women and cis men uh don't experience so yeah feel free to take it away 
Thank you. Um, I'm just like taking everything in because I feel like we've all experienced so much shit. Sorry, I'm swearing. <laughs> I'm gonna swear. I can't hold it in. Um, I, I feel, and I'm just like holding everyone, you know, just like close because it is so fucking hard doing this work and. And like, I, like, I guess like for myself as like a non-binary person, like I've experienced shit from men and like also like straight women as well. And like, like women that strongly identify with their reproductive organs and which is, you know, it is what it is. But like, I think for a lot of us non-binary people not being believed in our, our identities and experiences, is just such a common, like that's so normalized for us to just like never be believed. And for myself, like not being believed is just something that you like, that I've experienced since I was a little kid. And like a lot of us are so used to not being believed whether we're survivors or, you know, victims of other forms of violence. But I, I you know, non-binary people, trans people, like so like the, the system, there's policies like, structural policies, government things that are in place to continually erode like the rights of queer and trans and non-binary people and like make our lives a living hell, like unlivable. And, you know, while we're trying to just go about our life, you know, live in, we're also experiencing like other layers of shit in the community when it's like people not taking us seriously because they don't believe in our lived experiences, you know, oh, you don't experience it as bad as women do. Like, it's not a competition, you know, it's not a competition. I still get treated as a woman, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for my mom and my mom is a very complex human being. Uh, you know, she is a lot darker than I am. And, uh, you know, she was a war refugee and uh, lived also uh, practiced sex work when I was a kid too and you know experienced a lot of violence while living that lifestyle and just thinking about all these things it's like you know there are people out here talking like I mean, like particularly men and like you know women can also commit acts of violence too not just like harm but like sexual violence or emotional violence and you know, there's it, talking about like MMIW is a hot topic right now. And, and it's like, okay, yes, but we need to like address like these forms of lateral violence that is like actively like causing violence and the silencing is like contributing to the violence that like the women in our communities are experiencing. And, you know, my mother, you know, she is like an, a displaced indigenous woman, but it does not experience like the shit that a lot of First Nations women are experience, especially in the inner cities or in the communities. And like, it's, these things are so interconnected and, you know, on the front lines, especially when like, you know, folks like myself and like other people are like experiencing things like at home, you know, and then we go to the front lines and we're still hold, like trying to care for, you know, our inner child, but often we don't have the spoons and the space to hold that for each other, you know, like I, oh my goodness, it's just a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, I, I, I think even like this last like little bit, I've really come to like like understand the importance of centering survivors like period like without even ever ever having to ask them for their for proof of their stories and there's not enough of that in our movements and i think some of the challenges a lot of prairie like organizers face especially first nations women is not being believed you know and like being forced into positions to call out abusive men and having, you know, elders and aunties, like people that we look up to and deeply respect, like protecting a lot of these men. Oh, because the men have been colonized too. Oh, because the men have been traumatized too. Like why we need to stop coddling <laughs> people because of their traumas and like hold like consequences to actions, you know, like, yes, let's not be cops to each other. But like there, there has to be consequences for actions. And especially when men are in positions of power and especially when, you know, women who have caused harm are in positions of power over others that they've caused harm to. Like 
there needs to be like some kind of like restorative justice practices that we need to start implementing and also like educating our youth too like when I started getting into this work like I didn't know anyone like I didn't really have mentors and like the people that I looked up to who were quite older than myself were like also they didn't really have mentors either and you know I'm a strong advocate of intergenerational like trust building right and like educating and teaching young people about power imbalances like being able to name and identify power and violence because the things are so correlated and interconnected right and and being able to identify red flags too like it's like if I see like a 17 year old youth like drinking with like you know a bunch of older 20 year olds <laughs> like address that you know what I mean <laughs> like I, like I, you know I, what what Christy had to like experience like you did the right thing by stepping in and it's so hard to do that because yeah we also put ourselves out there and put ourselves at risk of like receiving hey I have a list of haters like I, there's an older que uh, queer uh, wo uh, indigenous woman in the community that has been coming at me for like 10 years, <laughs> since I was 19, you know, since I was 19 and nobody stood up for me. And I had to be the one like being like, this is messed up. Why is an older woman coming at me? You know what I mean? Like, and when we teach folks like, you know, how to identify power and violence in the community, that is a form of empowerment, right? And I think sometimes the fear of speaking out comes from not knowing, like, like, it's like, you know, when something's wrong, like deeply in your body, but you don't know how to identify it. And also like the fear, like it helps people overcome that fear. And when we are able to identify and figure out like these dynamics, we can support each other better. We can trust each other better. Like, even if I'm not your friend, but I see somebody that I care about that is hurting you, I'll have your back. Because it's, it's and, and that's the thing too, you know, and I've been in that position of like, Oh, like these homies that I loved so much caused harm to women, indigenous women, First Nations women in the community, you know, and like the, and the reluctance and the hesitancy that can also be an issue, like a problem that can create problems too. And we hesitate to call our homies out, you know, cause oh, they're good men, but they did fucked up shit, right? Like we got to stop protecting the homies. <laughs> we got to stop protecting the men. And that doesn't mean like, you know, throwing them in jail or whatever, like, no, there needs to be consequences. So like decentering, deplatforming, like them taking a step back from the community, them like disclosing the harm that they did, you know, that's something that a lot of men don't do. You know, they take a step back, but then they don't disclose what they did. So then they keep going around acting like every, oh, they don't know what I did. Like, no, we, it's like, that's gotta end. You know, that's gotta end. And yeah, we just, we gotta start like in our movements to centering survivors, you know, and, and by then, like we, by doing so, we protect the women that are on the front lines and the two spirit and the trans people that are on the front lines when we start, you know, protecting and centering survivors, like period. That's like my stance on that. <laughs> I think that's all I got to say about that. You know, it's hard out here on the prairies. I just, I want to be able to like, ugh, like I want to protect everyone. <laughs> that's out here doing this work you know it's hard okay I think that's it that's all I gotta say about that <laughs> nice uh that was that was awesome um thanks so much uh for like to everyone for sharing um some really hard truths um and just trying to get us all onto the screen together uh because I know we're kind of at the end of our time um, but I don't want, I want to, I want to leave us, um, to close off in a good way. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you for your courage to share these things. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, by having these conversations, it will spark more and more folks to have these conversations that might've been in hiding for, for way too long, you know, and I really believe that that's how harm is able to perpetuate is because uh, we we pretend like it's not there or it's in hiding. So by exposing it, I, I think is uh, a really good step. Um, 
but so to close us off in a really good way, I just wanted to go around and um, ask you all what's some what's a piece of advice you would you would provide to those that are listening about um, finding finding their purpose and stepping into their power like you all have in these movements. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Sophia first. Yeah, I don't have a, a long anything. Um, I would just say, uh, you know, whatever you're feeling is valid and, and, you know, to try and put your anger or your hurt or whatever into the movement and just, you know, make sure you're doing it in a good way and not putting anyone at harm, but at the same time, putting that passion and, and effort into protecting other people and protecting the land and uh, really respecting yourself as a warrior um, or, or stepping into that role when your people need it. That's, that's about it. Thanks, Sophia. Um, I'll pass it over to Canna House. What's some advice you would give to listeners about uh, stepping into their power and, and finding their purpose like you have? I would say to connect with the spirituality, connect, um, if you don't have people that that doesn't stop you that we heard from Christy, you know, just connecting with the plants and the trees and just being able to get out outside and being able to connect with that, breathe that fresh air. And we need so much, um, you know, the, the four, four pillars for a good health, you know, our healthy diet, a good a mental attitude, you know, exercise and rest and relaxation. Those are all parts of being healthy fully in all of our realms, you know, our spiritual and mental and our physical and our um, emotional. We don't differentiate. We're all connected and all of those are connected and we just need to be very strong in that we need to have no fear. We need to be able to stand and speak our truth and connect with our ancestors and that creator. And, you know, the ancestors, you know, are, we're born in here. This is a vessel we're given our bodies. Um, but this work that we're doing is creator's work and to tap into that in every way. And whether it's take, taking the cold dips in our, in our glacier creeks or in the sweat lodge or fasting or whatever it may be to connect and tap into that power because we come from tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mighty people in our nation um, and we're one of them. And so we can channel that and do this work and, you know, um, just be strong and in, in who you are and don't let anyone else silence you. There's so much strong people and, and educators and these just the youth are so powerful in their words and their influence now um tap into that and and to be good in every step and know that creator is watching us and you know all of our most strongest mightiest ancestors are watching us in our every moves right now and so we conduct ourselves in that way thank you thanks kind house um, so I'll pass it over to you, V. Um, what's some advice you would give to listeners about stepping into their purpose and their power? Pray. <laughs> A lot of prayers. Uh, I get. I guess, like from experience, like just don't wait around to don't wait around for someone to tell you what to do, you know, like if you want to, you know, start like a, a mutual aid collective or feed houseless folks or go out on the land and in the middle stop traffic or something, just go and do it, you know, and if you make mistakes, like there will be a community there, you know, there's it's like, especially like, nowadays back then like I, there wasn't really a lot but now there's a lot of people you know and especially with social media and whatnot like but yeah just you know uh work on i think the another big thing is work on building your moral compass and ethics <laughs> it's really important um but yeah pray pray a lot uh you know unpack 
a lot um, and just just do it just go out there and do it yeah you know if you want to go back go if you want to go out on the land go do it go on your go out to the land if you can do that like just yeah for real like Thanks, V. Um, and I'll pass it over to you, Christy. What's some advice you have for listeners about stepping into their purpose and their power like you have? Um, I agree with what everybody has said. Don't, don't wait. You know, as a young person, I wish that I had have, had have had, used my voice a lot sooner. You know, uh, I wish I, I know people don't really listen but I still wish that I had have used it a lot sooner. But I also, and I also wish that I had have went out to the land sooner than I did, you know, and the land has a way of speaking and it, it will be your greatest teacher. And you don't, you can live in the city and still connect. You know, every tree has a voice. If you're not listening, how could you, how could you learn from that tree? You know, we have to be, we have to love everything to the fullest of our possible ability. You know, our spirits are only here, as Kenaho said, in this vessel for a very short time. And so we, we have to understand how, how, how best you want to use your energy. You know, I, I could use my energy to be online all the time and just, you know, I don't know, fighting people that I don't agree with. But that would be a, a real waste, <laughs> you know, <laughs> could use my energy in other ways. And so understanding how to love and the importance of not gossiping, you know, is really, really important. I, I've heard stories of people, the, the old people, you know, on the trap line, they never gossiped because that could destroy a community and it could, it could affect your very survival. If you don't have confidence in your 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 brothers, your sisters, your your two spirited relatives, if you don't have confidence in them, how are we ever going to stand up and fight? How are we ever going to protect anything? We have to have confidence in each other, you know. And I appreciate every single one of you here. I appreciate the people who tuned in to listen, and uh, I send my love to you and my respect to all of you and keep fighting on. And if I can help in any way, I will help. You can call on me. I stand in solidarity with you all. I hope. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate everything you've had to share. Um, yeah, I, I just hope that these conversations will, you know, bring movements to even more powerful places. And um, that's what, I hope that, you know, maybe in a few years or decades, uh, we'll have more and more folks that are living off the land and going back to those old ways. But it's it's going to be a bit of a transition for us city folks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, by kind of talking about the struggles and also the beauty of it, um, Kanahos and, and Christy, I think it kind of might ease some folks to, to get there, you know, in a, in a, in a less nerve wracking way. And um, yeah, there's just so much we could talk about for hours, um, but just know that, you know, we, we're all experiencing these different things. We're all exper experiencing these microaggressions, but we're all experiencing the beauty of it all. And we get to witness this life um, in front of us. And so thank you all for being protectors of life. Um, in your many different ways. Uh, and so I just wanted to also say, like, if anyone uh, felt triggered or needed a, a little bit more support, please reach out. Um, like, we're here, A7G, feel free to message us. Um, like, light a smudge if that's what you do. We lit a smudge here in our house to pray for you. Um, use your tobacco, do those things that you need to do, talk to your support circles. Um, maybe it's just you want to share what you heard. And uh, I really encourage you to do that. Reach out to your friends and family and um, share that these messages. Um, and so with that, I think I'll close it off for, for today. 
Um, but I, yeah, once again, really appreciate everything that you all had to share. Hi, hi. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> nice. Thanks so much. We'll see you all soon. <laughs> Take care.